Good morning, Emmanuel. Hey, love that time of worship. Love that last song. Uh, <clears throat> just kind of reading the room, you know. Today I want to talk to you about being an example. And let me just challenge you here. Now, I, I saw a lot of folks up here in the front. Man, keep doing that. That's a good example. You've come here, you've seen the opportunity to not just have 40 minutes of relaxation and rest, but to engage God, to worship God. Now, some sit, some take a nap, whatever you got to do, but I, I, I want to encourage you to be an example setter, to set a tone, to, to, to make a movement happen, to get involved. Sometimes I come into this chapel and I stand in the back and I... And, and, there's concern in my heart that we have an opportunity to stand before the holy God of the universe, the God who created us, who died for us, who saved us. When we come in, I take it so lighthearted that the holy place that we have opportunity to engage God himself is kind of dialed down. It's kind of uh, not present in some of your hearts. It's concerning. Maybe we get too much of it. Maybe we're too overflowed with all the opportunity to just be in his presence and enjoy the blessings and on this private, Christian, God-filled campus that we take it for granted, maybe. I want to encourage you, those in front, be that example. Be the, the whole school, in my opinion, should take the opportunity to worship God with all of your might, might all of your heart, in full reverence and awe and openness to God who deserves way more than just sitting back doing nothing. That's not a judgment, that's a challenge. Get your focus. Be an example. Worship God. That maybe those around you might see, what have they got that I need? Because maybe I'll worship God. Today I want to talk about being an example be an example by what you say and by what you do. Be an example by what you say and what you do. How many saw the national title game with Clemson and Alabama? Anybody? Oh, what a game. That was an amazing game. I watched that game, and the best part was afterwards when they interviewed the coach, Coach Swinney. And I listened to that guy talk, and, and he credited everything that he had accomplished to God, he was, uh, he was humble in how he said it. It wasn't a fake thing. He really did overboard say. Now, they, they had to interview him on site, and you got to hear all the good God stuff. Now, on ESPN and all the other things, they did clippets of stuff, and they count, took that all out. But, but here's a guy who was saying a lot of stuff that would put him in place of being a great example of Christ in a professional world, in the football field, and, and, and giving all the glory to him. And then I went and did some research on him, and I realized that not only does he say the things that are right, he does what's right. His example in what he says and what he does matches. What an opportunity for that guy. I, I, I love listening to Derek Carr when he talks. He always takes the opportunity to be an example, to glorify God, even in all of his accomplishments. What he says, I follow him up. What he does, you are an example. Every one of you have influence somewhere in your life. You are being influenced and you are influencing. And we're going to look at a little passage here where Paul is talking to young Timothy, his uh, understudy, his, the guy he's mentoring, and he gives him a little advice on how to be a good example. And he found it in 1 Timothy 4 and 12. And I want to bring that to you today. Let's look at it, 1 Timothy 4 and 12. It says this, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. That's a pretty high call. Let's break it down a little bit and just go through it. First he says this, let no one. I don't, let no one. He says, really, saying you're in charge, even though you can't make anybody think what they think. But he's, he's commanding here, Paul is telling Timothy, be in charge of what people think. Let, you let no one. How do you let no one? I mean, you can't make me think what I think or not think. 
But it's kind of, that's the, that's the command he, he is giving him here. Like, what is it? We're going to find out later what he means. But, hey, let no one. And it's talking about how they see you. How are you known? I, I graduated in 1980. I got some things I'm not proud of. 1980, I graduated in 1980, and here, here, was, here was what I was known as in my community among my peers. It's a guy who got suspended twice. He uh, drinks beer, smokes pot, and snorts cocaine. And I was kind of known, but now th that's a horrible time in my life. I, I advise nobody to go down the stupidity of those roads, but that's who I was known as. Now, at 19, most of you know my story. I about died from an overdose, got in the hospital. God saved me. And, and when I came to Christ, I was radically changed for God. I was on fire for Jesus. But I'm known by something else. It took about three years, took about three years in my community renaming myself, being known because of what I said and what I did. And still people would see me years later that didn't know me since high school, and they're like, aren't you the guy that... Yeah, I'm that guy. Let no one, he tells them, and he's talking about what he is going to say and what he does in his life. He's a young guy, and he's not really respected, and, and Paul's trying to say, hey man, you can be an example. Let no one... I wonder if we took every student, put him on a list, and put three boxes beside each name, let's do this, Let's take the whole student body, every name, three boxes, and then we'll pass that out to every student and every staff member. And what they're going to do is they're going to take your name and they're going to put three words that describe you by each student. I wonder what the compilation of those words would say about you if we did that. Let no one. You see, when I hear that, I say, wow, I, I hope it would be you know, faithful, godly, worshiper. Maybe it's arrogant, selfish. I don't know. But this is how you have to evaluate you. Who, what would be said of you from those around you? He's telling Timothy, look, I'm going to command you to let no one. And then he says this, despise you for your youth. How do you do that? That means don't let anybody look down on you or think less of you. He's telling young Timothy in the audience of all those, he's, he's building him up to be a pastor and a leader, and he's, he's gifted to lead uh, this church, and he's telling him, don't let anybody despise you for your youth. First of all, how do you see yourself? I noticed talking to a lot of people your age and your generation that there, there's, a, there's a huge amount of people young like you that think so less of themselves. And in the world you live in, there's not a lot of encouraging going on. There's a lot of brokenness, broken homes. And, and I notice even though those are who are gifted in athletics and, and music and art and all these things, there's still there's this underlying value that's so low that they think so little of themselves. And it kind of sets the tone for how they operate. It's almost like, what's the big deal? I have so little value. Why try What do you think about your, do you understand your potential? Most movements in our world over history have been led by young people. The young energetics that have no fear of, of diving in and, and making a statement and making a stand and risking it all. Not living safe, but, but, but faithfully and, and moving through the world and, and, and the movements we have historical events of is usually done by young people. How do you see yourself? Do you see the potential? You have great value. You're not the church of tomorrow. We always hear that. You are the church of today. The things that have really moved through churches and organizations and communities have been the young people in those churches and communities that have got on fire, became an example, did, were not arrogant in how they saw themselves, but they saw the value of themselves very high, very powerful because of Christ in their life. And they moved in that. He's telling them here, let no one despise your youth. Walk in your calling, but do it with humility and respect, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. But he's also saying, hey, do not give them a reason to despise you. Own your stuff. What you do is what you do. you got to own that. He says, 
let no one despise you for your youth, but he says, but set the believers an example. Set the believers an example. Are you an example? He, he means to, to, be a, to be a model. Really, if you look at the word, it's like a mold. It would be like if you poured a cast out of lead and made a mold, and then now, now whatever you poured into that, every one you took out would be exactly like the next one. A candle, a pod, a cup. Be the mold for the world around you. That if everybody came like you, it would be a great example. Set the believers an example. If you were the spiritual mold for every student on this campus, what would be the spirituality of the student body? If you were the mold that everybody was like. Set an example, he tells them. Timothy had followed Paul. Now Paul here is telling him, hey, as people follow you, you got to set an example. If everybody in this whole school prayed like you prayed, what would be the level of prayer? If everybody read the Word of God the same amount of time and, 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 and energy that you read the Word of God, what would be the, stu- the body like as far as reading the Word of God? If your passionate pursuit of a relationship with Jesus was the model of every student here, what would be the passionate pursuit of Jesus? High, on fire, low, don't care. What would it be if you were the example for everybody? If serving people was poured into every student out of the model of how you serve others besides yourself, how much serving others would be happening here? This is what he's challenging him with. Be an example to the believers. And then Paul gives five traits that will empower Timothy to live this out because it seems impossible. Let's look at him. He says these five things. In speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Five things. So let's take a look at each one of them and see if they're easy or hard or if they can even be accomplished. First one is this. In your speech, has your speech been a good example today? What if we took the last three days of every word you spoke, the last three days, put it on a recording and played it right now in chapel? What would your speech be as an example of what you say? It's not just the words you say, it's the attitude in what you say it. A lot of times people will say the right thing in, 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 out of their mouth, but their heart is not wrong in how they say it. So it's not just what comes out, but it's the condition of your heart of what you say it. What are you saying? He's saying, I'm holding you accountable to be an example to the believers by what you say. You can't live like you want, say what you want, and then be an example. But what you do say will be your example. And then the words are so powerful. What you say. Anybody ever been hurt by words? Man, most people. We learned last week from Pastor Scott about the tongue and the words. You see, they're so powerful, and we use them so lightly. We... uh, my wife, some of you know my wife, her name's Karen. She leads a, a life group here on campus. Who's in my wife's life group? Anybody? Oh, some girl. You're the girls that I'm going broke over the coffee thing. She has the coffee group. You know, it's about 60 bucks to get 12 kids coffee. <laughs> but she loves you guys. She was in uh, eighth grade, Roosevelt Junior High, Kingsburg. This little story about words, how words so greatly impact people. And she told her mom, her dad had died, she was uh, just a mom raising two kids. She told mom, hey, I want to try for the cheerleading squad. And mom said, oh yeah, fine, no problem, go for it. So she's so excited. First time to launch out and try to accomplish something. She tries out for the cheer squad for Roosevelt Junior High. And she makes the squad. And she comes home and says, mom, she's so excited. Mom, I made the cheer squad. I just need the $100 to give to buy the uniforms and then... And her mom said, I don't have a hundred dollars. She said, Mom, you I told her I was gonna try out. And her mom told her this. Now her mom didn't mean to hurt her. She said, Karen, I never thought you'd make it. That's not funny. That's not funny in any way. If you've been there, you know it's not funny. Because it took several years of her life. You see, you can't take back words you say. 
And the words you say have huge power in people's lives. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it eat its fruit. What are you saying today? Are you building people up? Are you, are you bringing life? Are you just causing death all around you? Are you just sarcastic and smart aleck and cut down because it's cool? It's too awkward and weird to be uplifting and encouraging? Be an example by what you say. Sometimes we don't even realize we hurt people. I, I, I was a Pop Warner football player. Loved the team, loved my coaches, my coaches loved me. They said something to me over and over each week that they never thought, ah, we're just messing around. But I, I was in 4-H also. And then one practice a week I had to miss. Because on Wednesday night I had a leather class for 4-H. Well, this guy's had a daughter in 4-H and, and all she took was sewing. And so when we would come back to practice on Thursday, me and my brother, Every week, the coach, God love him, just too stupid to realize how damaging words are, would say, here come the sewing sisters. Sounds funny, right? That wasn't funny, man. To a kid already struggling with insecurity and inferiority to be said that by your coach in front of your peers, that took a long time to work out in my life. Let me tell you something. You better be setting an example of speech that's glorifying to God, uplifting to people, because you're, you're called to be like him and to represent him. He told Timothy, be an example in your speech. And he says, to those who love it will eat its fruit. Like, the words you say are planting a tree, and it's going to produce fruit. And is it going to be life to somebody or death to somebody? Now, you can say, forgive me. I'm sorry. We can make amends. We can make things all right. We can, and that's been done many times in my life. But you can never take back the words you say. Never take them back. When they come out of your mouth, they're gone. And they land. And they produce. You can't take it. Be careful that the words you're saying are an example to the believers. Speak truth in love. Be an encourager in a world of sarcasm. Give somebody a compliment. If everyone on this campus used the words you use, the way you use them, what would this campus sound like? Is being an example in speech hard or easy? It's pretty hard sometimes. He goes on and says this. He says, in your conduct or in your behavior, the, the matters of life, he challenges Timothy. Not just what you say, but what you do. Everything you do is an example. All your actions and reactions. Now, some people own their actions, but uh, not my reactions. He hit me, so I hit him back. Well, they did this to me, so I get to do that back. No, no. You can't qualify your wrong because somebody did you wrong. All your reactions to the wrongs done against you, you have to own. You got to own what you do and, and the reactions and the actions. And Paul tells Timothy here, hey man, don't be, people look down on you by what you do. Be an example of your actions. When some, someone says something mean to you, do you just give it back because that's what they get? Got to own that. Your little brother annoys you, do you say, get out of my room, I hate you, and slam the door? Can't have that action. You're leaving campus and you're a senior and you put a couple of your sophomore friends in the trunk because you want them to go to lunch with you? Not that that's ever happened. That's wrong, man. You gotta own that. What are your actions? They're coming out of your life. Do you lie to keep yourself out of trouble? James said this. He told us, be doers of the word, not just hearers only. It does nothing to hear all this stuff and not do it. <laughs> What are the conduct of your life? Be an example in your conduct and what you're doing. If everybody on this campus acted like you, what would the campus be like? Would it be an awesome place of living right in what we do, or would it be chaos, self-centered, all about me stuff? Set an example, Timothy, students of Emmanuel. In your conduct, what you do, then he says this. He goes on and says, in love. Be an example of love. Now, this isn't, you look good, girl, I want to go out with you because I love you. It's not that kind of love. It's something totally different. This is love that's selfless, sacrificial, and unconditional. Be an example in your love. Love by serving in humility. It's the highest kind of love. It's noble of its devotion toward God and others. This is a love of the will. 
It's, a deci- it's not motivated by physical attraction or emotional attraction. It's not like, you look good, honey. It's not like that. It's I'm deciding to love because even the unlovable I love. And there's many. Sometimes I've been the unlovable. Love, a decision of your will. I was counseling a couple one time, a marriage counseling. It was falling apart. They said they wanted it fixed, but they, they just couldn't come to terms. And, and, and I remember, the, I remember the, <clears throat> the wife said this statement. She said, I couldn't help myself, but because of the affair she was having, she said, I couldn't help myself. I just fell in love with another person. That's not the love I'm talking about here. That, this love is not determined by physical, emotional. It's a decision that you make. I will love because God loved the highest. Be an example in love. John 13, 35, by, all, by this all men will know that you are my disciples. How? If you love one another, even the most unlovable. Not those you just get along with. Anybody can do that. But only through God and God's love in you can you love the unlovable. Be an example in love. Sacrificial love. We see it through Jesus. He left heaven, came to earth. He became human. He got spit on him. He got a crown of thorns on his head. They killed him. Speared him in the side and killed him. You know why? Because he allowed that. Because he loved us. That's sacrificial love. That's the example. True love, there must be giving and giving to the point of sacrifice. Do you love? Can you love those around you to the point of sacrifice? God loved the world so much that he gave his son made a sacrifice be an example in love selfless love all about God and all about others not about you that's what that's the call to Timothy the leader that's the call to you the leaders you're the Christ example of your community you represent him not just here but everywhere you go everything you do you have to have that challenge just like Timothy was challenged if everybody on campus love like you, would it be a self-centered or a selfless campus? Be an example of those around you. He goes on to say this, be an example in faith. Hebrews 11, 1 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So there's two ingredients to faith. One is hoping it or hoping for something. And then two, you don't have it yet or you don't see it yet. That's what faith is. You gotta have faith. There's two options of faith. One is God and one's everything else. Do you have faith in God? I'll end with this. Purity, the last thing. Purity, your morals, your standards. God says purity, you gotta be pure. This is a tough one. That purity is the gatekeeper of your mind and soul. Psalms 119-9, how can a young man keep his ways pure by guarding it according to God's word? We're just not able to, guys. We need God's word. We need to have his spirit in our life. He said in Matthew 5, 27, you have heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, everyone that looks at a woman with lust intent has already committed it in his heart. Wow, that's a high standard. To just have lust over somebody, that's, I'm, I'm, I've done it now in my heart. Guys, we need to be pure. And we need God's power to bring purity to our lives. It's not okay to watch porn, to have sex before marriage. One guy told me, hey man, it's not a big deal. We've been dating a long time and we, we fondle all over each other, but we have our clothes on, so it's not really bad. I said, you're out of your mind if you think that's the level of purity God wants from your life. Who are you fooling? That's stupid. Be pure. Put a guard on your mind. What you see through these ears, these eyes and hear through these ears, that is the portal for your soul. And you better have a guard on it with God's word in purity. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. And we believe you can, guys. We believe in you. Be the example among your peers on this campus, in your community. Let's pray. God, we thank you today that in your word you challenge us. You challenge Timothy and you challenge us. And we can do this, God, in your power, in your strength. Holy Spirit, like that last song, would you come over us and empower us to live out the calling in our life because it is impossible without you. We need you, God. Empower these young people that they be an example for you 
and all these things. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Seniors. <laughs>